Well, good evening. This is um, a little bedtime story, economic bedtime story, um, for people who are interested in listening to these issues, sort of as a follow-up to Joe's video on the same subject matter. Uh, here are some excerpts from um, a guy named uh, Robert um, McChesney. He's actually a, um, a historian. He's a professor. I think he still teaches at University of Chicago, Illinois. I'm, I'm not. Don't quote me on that, but I'm not sure where he teaches actually right now. But uh, he he is a scholar in uh, uh, a scholar of history in Central Asian studies, Iran, Afghanistan, that sort of thing. He wrote an interesting foreword to somebody else's book, and um, I'd like to read you some excerpts from um, this essay that he wrote. So, basically he says, neoliberalism is defining, is defining economic paradigm of our time. And, you know, don't let the isms bother you. Scholars tend to do that kind of stuff. They sort of put everything into isms. It doesn't matter very much. So. It's the content of the essay um, that's interesting. So neoliberalism, then, is the defining political economic paradigm of our time. It refers to the policies and processes whereby a relatively handful of private interests are permitted to control as much as possible of social life in order to maximize their personal profits. Associated initially with Reagan and Thatcher, for the past two decades, neoliberalism has been the dominant global political economic trend adopted by political parties of the center and much of the traditional left and the right. These parties and the policies they enact represent the immediate interests of extremely wealthy investors and less than 1,000 corporations globally. Aside from some academics and members of the business community, the term neoliberalism is largely unknown and unused by the public at large, especially in the United States. There, to the contrary, uh, neoliberal initiatives are characterized as free market policies that encourage private enterprise and consumer choice, reward personal responsibility and entrepreneurial initiative, and undermine the dead hand of the incompetent, bureaucratic, and parasitic government that can never do any good, even if well intended, which it rarely is. A generation of corporate financed public relations efforts has given these terms that I just mentioned and ideas as near as a sacred aura. As a result, the claims they make rarely require defense and are invoked to rationalize anything from lowering taxes on the wealthy and scrapping environmental regulations to dismantling public education and social welfare programs. Indeed, any activity that might interfere with corporate domination of society is automatically suspect because it would interfere with the workings of the free market, which is advanced as the only rational, fair, and democratic allocator of goods and services. At their most eloquent, proponents of neoliberalism sound as if they are doing poor people, the environment, and everyone else a tremendous service as they enact policies on behalf of the wealthy few. The economic consequences of these policies have been just the same just about everywhere. 
and exactly what one would expect. A massive increase in social and economic inequality, a marked increase in severe deprivation for the poorest nations on the planet, a disastrous global environment, an unstable global economy, and an unprecedented bonanza for the super-rich. Confronted with these facts, defenders of these orders and policies claim that the spoils of the good life will invariably spread to the broad masses of the population. As long as these policies that exacerbated these problems are not being interfered with. Now, this is a very long essay, so it's also copyrighted, so I'll have to be careful how much I'm going to read here. But I, I, I guess I could read a little more. I think it'll be okay. Um, in other words, you know, this is capitalism with gloves off. It represents an era in which business forces are stronger and more aggressive and face less organized opposition than ever before. In this political climate, they attempt to codify their political power on every possible front, and as a result make it increasingly difficult to challenge business, and next to impossible for non-market, non-commercial, and democratic forces to exist at all. In other words, democracy is permissible as long as the control of business is off limits to popular deliberation and change, i.e., so long as it isn't a democracy. Now, Mr. McChesney goes on to say, that although um, there are market and um, frequently observed dissatisfactions with um, Democrats and Republicans alike, electoral politics in such a system is uh, a, where a notion of competition and free choice have really little meaning anymore. In some respects, the caliber of debate and choice in such elections tends to be closer to that of a one-party communist state than a genuine democracy. And he also has to say about this kind of democracy that with its notion of uh, the market über alles, that it takes aim at a certain sector, and the sector that he's talking about is the community sector. You know, people just getting along, not just uh, everybody just out doing their own thing and the hell with everyone else, uh, but actually forming communities and interacting with each other. So these policies are aimed against that. Instead of citizens, um, these, these policies uh, produce um, consumers. And instead of communities, they produce shopping malls. And the net result is basically an atomized society of disengaged individuals who feel demoralized and socially powerless. So there is um, a big problem here. And his prescription to these problems, I mean, he doesn't have um, any great big answers either, but what he does suggest is the, uh, that the social uh, change um, or struggle for change is not a hypothetical issue. And this, of course, is also what we're saying, because um, we're trying to bring about change. And for us, it's also not a hypothetical issue. And it's actually very important. So the current neo